for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's November 2019, and you're listening to Episode 150 of Postmodern Realities, which is a conversation about recent Mr. Rogers movies. On this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Philip Tallon. He has a PhD in theology from the University of St. Andrews, and he is an assistant professor at Houston Baptist University. Phil has written an online exclusive film review article, and it's available free at our website, equip.org, and it's called The Eternal Importance of Being Awkwardly Earnest, a review of A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Phil, it's good to have you on. Glad to be here. Well, I'm glad to welcome Phil back for episode 150. Phil was our very first guest talking about the films of Quentin Tarantino three years ago, almost four years ago now. And then he was a guest at episode 50, episode 100, and now we're celebrating episode 150, talking about the movies again with Phil. And so there have been some recent films about Mr. Rogers. He's kind of become a little bit, I think, one of those beloved pop culture figures, not unlike Bob Ross, the painter. There are even Funko Pop figurines of Mr. Rogers that you can get. And I believe I even have one. I think my family gave me one for Christmas last year. So there have been two recent films. One is a documentary that came out last summer. And the one that we're going to be talking about, well, we're going to talk about both of those films, is the one that Phil wrote the review for, which is called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And it stars Tom Hanks as Mr. Fred Rogers, and Matthew Reese plays a journalist who is writing a in-depth kind of feature article about Mr. Rogers, or turns into a feature article about Mr. Rogers for Esquire magazine. And so this is kind of a fictionalized dramatization of that article, how it came to be. So it seems like, as I mentioned, there's a lot of interest in Mr. Rogers right now, just from a pop culture perspective. He's you know, kind of people's nostalgia for their childhood. He's, you know, really hip and cool these days. So why do you think, what is it about Mr. Rogers that is making people very interested in him at this particular time and culture? Yeah, well, Mr. Rogers, and they'll never underestimate the power of nostalgia, which is, you know, I, I am now getting to the age when the songs that played in my youth are now playing at the gas station and at Applebee's uh, because I'm I'm now getting into that sort of prime old enough demographic, and so I think there's a lot of going back into the archives and pulling out things that Gen Xers you know knew and loved growing up, and to sort of reproduce and show these things to to everybody. So now it's Mr. Rogers' time, but uh, there's also a cultural you know reason for Mr. Rogers uh, inter- interest in Mr. Rogers right now, as well as uh, an artistic you know, specifically the artistic reasons. The the cultural reason being that there's a lot of discussion right now about just widespread animosity and, you know, the wider culture. We have, you know, incredibly polarized politics, which say politics actually is more polarized than it ever has been before. You know, there's a lot of just, you know, vitriol and, and social media has enabled, you know, people anonymously to, you know, troll each other. And, and so a figure who basically is the incarnation, the human incarnation of the platonic ideal of, graciousness and kindness you know, is of special cultural interest. Mr. Rogers represents that probably more clearly than just about anybody else. And so I think that there's a fascination and a desire perhaps to conjure this secular saint and reflect on his character and his work and in order to maybe perhaps remind us of, of something that we need reminding of. Of course, there's also an artistic distinctive, which is that you know, Mr. Rogers was incredibly well known in the culture, but his his television work was was even at the time very distinct from other televised entertainment. And so, you know, the uh, it was a you know intently focused on education. His program was, and not just factual education, but emotional education, and was was incredibly deliberate and you know, slow paced, very out of step, even with entertainment at the time. And so we now we live in an age of hyper accelerated entertainment. You know, kids are on the iPads and kids these days and everything is, you know, super fast. And so I think he's sort of a fascinating artistic creator that in much of them, his niceness is a stands in contrast to sort of ambient vitriol, his artistic works, 
stand in contrast to our incredibly accelerated entertainment? Well, you mentioned that it's kind of nostalgia for some of childhood television programming when that was just kind of coming into existence specifically on public television where, of course, there was Mr. Rogers and there was also Sesame Street at the time in the 60s, I guess, or the early 70s. And so some people, if they're not a Gen Xer, maybe there's some millennials or younger listening to this podcast may not know who Mr. Rogers was, but he was actually an ordained Presbyterian minister. He went to seminary, but he also had a music degree. And I think he attended college and got a degree in music. And I believe he met his wife at that time, his wife, Joanne. And he also did some studies in child development. So he had this very homey kind of show with just really old school, you know, puppets. And Sesame Street had puppets, but these were puppets that seemed really like puppets, just like an old time puppet show in his particular show. And so he really felt as it is kind of laid out in the documentary, which is kind of about his life and his work. And it's called Won't You Be My Neighbor? It came out in March of 2018, which was released on what it would have been the 90th birthday of Mr. Rogers. But he really felt called as ministry to programming for kids. So he saw his program as a ministry. So how did his particular show, like I said, it was kind of homey. It had these really, I think today we think pretty hokey, you know, puppets. How did that contrast with popular television entertainment at the time? And even today, you just talked about iPads. I mean, how is it different from that? Well, yeah. So Mr. Rogers... Television work goes back to the you know very early days of TV, so he was kind of entering the workforce at the right time to you know begin working in public television, and so he started you know doing basically public broadcasting aimed at children. He did study in child psychology as well as ministerial training and training in music, and so he pretty early on was creating programming for the public broadcasting station in Pittsburgh, where he's from, and. You know, the show always had a very deliberate pace. Mr. Rogers' work is, you know, defined by his interest in being able to communicate very clearly to children. And so you can actually read online, he he had these guidelines, you know, for translating, as it were, things into child speak. So, you know, you want to state something clearly using terms that children can understand, so no big words. And so you might say something like, you know, don't play in the street, right? Well, okay, that's pretty simple. You'd say, oh, but actually you shouldn't, you know, communicate though in like why you're saying this. So, you know, you want to say, don't play where it's not safe. Actually, when you communicate with children though, it's better to state things positively. So you wouldn't want to say, play where it's safe. But there's a problem here, which is that kids don't know where it's safe. And so you would rephrase this as, ask your parents where it is safe to play. And so he was very intentional in his work to communicate very clearly. And so he had a, as it were, kind of a child psychologist training behind a lot of his television work, which was focused on, you know, basic education, cultural education, but then also helping children to understand and articulate the experiences that people go through, their emotional realities and so forth. And so his show, you know, feels, you know, incredibly deliberate and slow paced and, he was very concerned at the just the crassness and the emotional immaturity that children's television, even when he was first starting out, so you might think things are bad now, but when he was first starting out, he disliked a lot of the children's television programming, people throwing pies in each other's face or just falling down, and he thought it was dehumanizing. And so he set out to create children's programming that he, you know, felt was good for children, you know, on an intellectual level as well as an emotional and a social level. So there's this very strange quality to watching Mr. Rogers contrast with almost everything else. Really, nobody has done anything that is as comprehensively focused and as deliberate as Mr. Rogers and children's programming. The late media theorist Neil Postman, he wrote this book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And in that, he was a great critic of television. He posited that television is only entertaining. It can never, it's not a good 
vehicle to communicate ideas. It's not effective to be educational. And basically the entertainment that it provides is rather mindless. And so he wrote this much after Mr. Rogers started his show on public television. But do you think that the content of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood overcame this particular criticism? Because it was there to educate children. A lot of times it was either about current events or a lot of times it was about like abstract type of things that, you know, whether it be like literally standing still for a minute to watch a minute pass to see how long a minute would be or to think about what it means to be sad or to be angry. Do you think that, you know, also the content of his show, did it have any lasting cultural impact? Because that's the point of Postman, you know, it's just fleeting, it's mindless, it doesn't impact anything, it can't change the way people think because television cannot communicate ideas. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I think that Postman's observations are, are helpful in general, um, though, you know, not in always in specific. And, and you know, they are, they are a helpful warning, though, you know, a bit broad. I, you know, I, I do think that Mr. Rogers' uh, neighborhood was a was a wonderful example of, you know, thoughtful programming for children and had a sort of intentionality and thoughtfulness and, and elicited that in its viewers that is is unusual. And so this is an example from his television program, but I was re-watching some famous clips of Fred Rogers and he was given a Lifetime Emmy Award, um, Achievement Award. And when he took the stage, you know, he's there surrounded by all of these beautiful people and and he thanked everyone. And then he said, you know, everyone is here because someone has loved them into being. And it's good to think about those people that have cared for you and enabled you to achieve the things that you have. Let's take 10 seconds and everyone think about those special people in their lives. And there's a kind of laughter in the audience. And then he pulls out his watch and he points to his watch and he says, I'll keep track of time. And then he looks down at his watch and there's silence, and you cut to various people in the audience as they sit there and are, you know, on their faces, you can clearly see that they're beginning to reflect, and they, you know, some of them begin to cry at the end of the 10 seconds. He says, oh, isn't that wonderful? So I think that sort of intentionality overcomes the critiques of Postman that, you know, television must be merely mindless. It's, it can be a very intentional medium at causes us to reflect and reflect deeply and valuably. The film, um, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, has a moment toward the center of the movie, which isn't thematically the core, but maybe is, you know, spiritually getting it, you know, a big part of Mr. Rogers' artistic work, where Mr. Rogers and the main character of the movie, Lloyd Vogel, are sitting in this restaurant. And it's a strange scene because for anybody who's seen the documentary that came out the year before, you recognize all these faces from Mr. Rogers' own real life, his wife, and co-workers, and so forth. And everyone seems to be sort of aware of everything Mr. Rogers is saying, even though they're not particularly close. And so he tells Lloyd that he wants them to stop for a minute and do this same experiment I just described. And the whole film pauses as Mr. Rogers tells Lloyd to think about uh, the people that have loved him. He recreates, as it were, the same uh, experiment that he did before the Emmy audience. And so we see the diners and the restaurant, everyone kind of stopping to think about people who have loved them. We see the faces of different people. And then breaking the fourth wall, Tom Hanks playing Fred Rogers turns and looks at the camera directly out into the audience as we wait this for this minute of silence. And so the, the audience is invited to participate in this experiment as well, not merely to passively watch, but to actively engage and reflect on people who have loved them. This goes on for the minute, and then the minute ends and the, the film resumes. But that's a very thoughtful, mindful use of artistry, you know, that actively calls us to engage. And so I think, you know, really excellent art avoids you know, the worst of Postman's critique. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest is Dr. Philip Tallon, and he has written a film review article for us, and it's free online at our website, equip.org, and it's called 
The Eternal Importance of Being Awkwardly Earnest, a review of A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. We'd also like to invite you to subscribe to the Christian Research Journal. A subscription is $33.50, and you can subscribe online by going to our website, equip.org. In addition, if a subscription is not in your budget this month, we'd like to ask you for a small gift of your time in one of two ways. The first would be, please go to wherever you get your podcasts or to Apple Podcasts and rate and review our podcast. When you provide a written review and a rating, which we hope is five stars, then you help other people find our content. And the other easy way to help people find our content is simply by sharing this on social media. You can email links to this content whether it's a link to the actual Apple podcast landing page where people can subscribe to the podcast, or maybe a link to this episode or another past episode you've enjoyed that you can get to from equip.org. We'd really appreciate it. The other thing you could do is you could tip us for our content to help keep our content free. Our website has literally thousands of pieces of content, whether it's audio or video or podcasts, or articles from the Christian Research Journal, we don't have a paywall. It's completely free to anyone in the world who wants to come and be equipped through our resources. And so at the Postmodern Realities podcast landing pages for each of the individual episodes, you can find a link there to tip us. A tip would be $3, $5, $10, maybe the cost of a gourmet coffee drink. If you drink those, maybe skip one of those during the week and give us a tip. Or maybe it's maybe skipping a movie one weekend and giving us a tip for the cost of what would be your movie ticket. So when you do those things, you help partner with us to provide this content in the Christian Research Journal, our articles free online, like exclusive online articles like this film review, and to keep our website completely free. And we thank you for your partnership. Well, one thing that I mentioned is that Mr. Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian minister in the mainline Presbyterian denomination, and he did see his um, program, as I mentioned earlier, as a ministry that he was doing, a ministry with children particularly. So how does Tom Hanks in the dramatized film portray Mr. Rogers' faith? And then how does the documentary portray his faith? Um, I think that they explore his faith in different ways. I would say in the documentary, mostly through um, talking to people who knew him, whether it's his wife or fellow ministers or his son. Yes, well, certainly almost everyone is familiar with Mr. Rogers as a saintly, you know, loving figure. And some people are aware that he has this ministerial training and was then ordained basically to be a television broadcaster, but it's not, it wouldn't be apparent to most people who are, you know, watching his show that he was a minister. He's doing work in, you know, public space. And so I think, you know, he sometimes treats matters of faith, but seems to say very little explicitly about his faith. So it's a bit of an open question as to what his theology really is. We do see in the movie, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, we see Mr. Rogers praying. And this was something that Fred Rogers did is that every morning he would pray. He had a lot of people who were connected with him and he would pray for those people who had asked him to pray for them. And he would often ask other people to pray for him. And there's a story in the article on which the film, the recent film is based. It talks about Fred Rogers encountering a, um, a young man who was having a lot of difficulty and uh, and he asked this young man, he said, you know, would you pray for me? Uh, and this was, young man was very moved that instead of Mr. Rogers offering to pray for him, he asked him to, to pray for Mr. Rogers. And later on, the interviewer said, well, that was, you know, very good of you. You must have known that he needed to kind of feel empowered by this. And Fred Rogers just said, well, no, I think someone who's been through that sort of difficulty must be very close to God. So there's a kind of a theological minimalism, a kind of a kindliness to Mr. Rogers' faith. It seems that's you know reflected in the documentary and in the in the movie, which is that it, you know very grace heavy 
focus. Grace was a, you know, was an important value for Mr. Rogers. You know, very little, you know, speaking about sin or the dangers of the world, or even explicitly talking about the kind of need for a confessional relationship with, with Jesus Christ. That wasn't what he did through his television program, and it seems not to have been a big part of his personal kind of ministry, as it were, to his co-workers and so forth. And the, so I think the film shows that he had a, a warm and vibrant faith and reflects, as it were, the kind of minimalism of his expression of his faith throughout a lot of his career. Since the program wasn't specifically theological, and it seems as far as himself, and specifically in the dramatization film that Tom Hanks is playing, Fred Rogers, you know, when people asked him questions about himself personally, he would kind of deflect those and ask people about themselves. And so, like you said, it's not really particularly theological. And I don't know that even in the documentary, it's not particularly theological. I think there's just a generalization of there's aspects of Christianity that Mr. Rogers wanted to embody that being like you mentioned, grace and forgiveness and acceptance and love. Uh, But that love is just kind of generalized. It's not really specifically tied or mentioned like the love of God, for example. So did Mr. Rogers, did he ever explicitly talk about Jesus or in his kind of more general, how it's portrayed, his more general faith? Can we know what Mr. Rogers thought about who Jesus was? You know, it's not apparent. I did. I tried to do a little more reading around to see if I could find any, you know, theological statements by Mr. Rogers. And I wasn't able to come up with much of anything. Definitely, there's a a faith-fueled intentionality behind a lot of his work. And that the, the 2018 documentary does a decent amount. It's not for kids, it's for grown-ups, But it does a lot to point out some of the intentional things behind Mr. Rogers' televised ministry, as it were, for the public, you know, down to the song that he sings at the beginning of every program, Won't You Be My Neighbor? This harkens back to the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus asks, which of these men was this man's neighbor? And so it, Mr. Rogers is is intentionally, though in a way that's not apparent, you know, intentionally trying to kind of offer, as it were, a sort of a proclamation, very generalized, of, you know, this this call to be in, you know, loving relationship and community, to be close. And he actually unpacks this explicitly. So, you know, I mean, as far as if I had to guess about what his theology was, you know, I'd assume kind of a sort of mid-century Protestant liberalism, you know, that he got from his, you know, mainline seminary training. But he doesn't address this very explicitly. And so one just can't ultimately know. Well, one of the things that the documentary specifically brings up towards the end of it is just some critiques that he received in the media about his approach to telling children that they are valued, that they're important, that they're loved, and kind of, uh, if you've read critiques like about the millennial generation, I guess, that, you know, we've allowed children to think that everyone deserves a trophy, that everybody's important. And so each person thinks that loving themselves is the most important thing. So what do you think of this criticism that was aimed at his approach? Yes, yeah, so, well, the, and uh, if anybody is interested in this, the, the 2018 documentary deals with this briefly, and I think in a, in a very direct and, and challenging way, um, which is that one of the interviewees you know, says, well, if, if you deny that um, each person has, possesses inherent dignity just by virtue of their humanity, and is you know, and you deny that they're worthy of love as a result of that. Then you, you know, you deny some of the central affirmations of the Christian faith that each person is created the image of God and that God loves them. And so I think that's a helpful response to maybe a reductive criticism of what Mister Rogers is trying to do. It may be an entirely valid to criticize you know a lot of the messages that you know, that we do get through media, not so much through Fred Rogers, but, you know, every Disney movie seems like the lesson is just be yourself, as if there's no real need for people to grow and change. And that is not what Mr. Rogers intended to teach. He wanted to affirm uh, and care for, through his work, you know, each person that heard this message to understand that they're worthy of love and that there are special things about them that are wonderful. They have unique gifts. But his, so much of his work was also about being able to grow and mature 
and that only in the context of a loving kind of relationship by being valued can one you know best grow and mature so that one no longer you know struggles with immature emotional reactions one's able to behave you know in ways that are appropriate uh, and so there is a challenge on the far side of this warm you know inviting call in Mr. Rogers work that uh, is is perhaps easy to overlook if you're only dealing in sound bites. If you only just think about him as just being someone who says, you know, I think you're wonderful and doesn't understand that so much of his work was about, you know, growth and emotional maturity so that one could then, you know, become a person who is, you know, is fully formed. And that's what, that's a message you don't get in a lot of you know, popular media, which just wants to merely affirm, tell people they're okay, offers no challenge. Mr. Rogers actually does both. And so, I, I, you know, there's a, a famous interchange that Fred Rogers had in 1969 defending Corporation Public Broadcasting's budget, a uh, $20 million budget, and came before the, the Senate and talked about his, his mission. And he talked so, you know, earnestly and intensely, kind of stole the show, overcame this grumpy senator that he was speaking to. And he offers this song that he sings at the end of his testimony that talks about how we can control our anger. We can learn to say stop to our anger. It's a very funny moment. It's a very unusual sort of thing that we're very unaccustomed to hearing in in popular media to talk not only about emotions, but also to talk about self-control. So that's still a, a, a wonderful and a worthy message for, for children or anyone to hear, that they're valuable, they have special good things about them, that they're worthy of love, but then also that there's a possibility for each of us to grow and a need for each of us to grow in order to become fully mature people. I think that is entirely laudable and, and nothing that we should worry about. I think one of the neat things that was brought out by the documentary as well as the dramatization film with Tom Hanks is that Mr. Rogers really took time to listen to children. And I think a lot of times adults don't tend to do that. Even if we're, we, even some of us are, who are parents know that, you know, we get to be busy, especially when your children are younger and they're asking you a lot of questions and it would take a long time to sit there and explain it. It seems to me that he really communicated that with uh, looking the child, getting down to their level, looking them in the eye, saying that he was listening to them and being patient to wait as they talk to him without dismissing them. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and I think that's actually a bit of a shortcoming of the film, uh, which which is really focused on adult problems, adult problems that are connected to childhood traumas. But it's a it's a it's a film. Both the documentary and the and the, the movie with Tom Hanks are really aimed at grown ups. And the new you know film has some moments where we see you know Fred Rogers connecting with and getting down on the level of children. But you know that really was the thing that he cared about, right? That was his that was his mission. In life, and that even th- that is still very uh, challenging to. Uh, for, I think for most of us to do it requires a lot of work to to get down on the level of a of a child to understand and recall what it was like to be a child. There's a, a story in the Tom Juno article on which the film, the recent film, has been based, and in it he talks about how some ophthalmologists who work on children's eyes were asking for help connecting with children and communicating with children. And so they had asked Mr. Rogers, to, you, you know, would you write something about this? And so he had kind of outsourced this to somebody else to here, could you come up with some advice? And the person wrote all this stuff and he eventually just scratched it all out. And he just wrote, um, recall that you were once a child too. And uh, very simple, direct advice for people who are treating children to remember what it's like to be a vulnerable young person who doesn't understand, but who has very real emotions. And there's a conceptual there's conceptual work there, but there's also just a lot of effort that's required, which most of us grow weary of doing. Well, finally, I want to end with some fun rapid fire questions for Phil. So, Phil, it's Thanksgiving in a couple of days. Pumpkin pie or apple pie? Oh, pumpkin pie all the way. And did you watch Mr. Rogers growing up as a kid? I did. I did. I, I watched Mr. Rogers there. I went through a brief period when I was very young where I did not watch Mr. Rogers because I was terrified to watch uh, Mr. Rogers because uh, he had the Incredible Hulk uh, featured on the show. And when I was about four, uh, I was very frightened of the Incredible Hulk. Now, he, I think the reason he actually had, to his credit, the reason he had uh, 
Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno, the stars in the Incredible Hulk on, I wanted to show Children the Transformation, was precisely for someone like me who was freaked out by this TV show that they saw when they were very young. And um, and so he, he was doing it for good reasons, but I just the mere thought of the Incredible Hulk being on the TV show put me off Mr. Rogers for about six months. Uh, but I, I recall watching him fondly and, and have great uh, personal affection for that television show. I remember watching it too growing up, but I don't think it was my favorite. I wasn't really allowed to watch TV, but I could watch PBS, so I could watch Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers. But um, Mr. Rogers seemed more nebulous to me, and um, Sesame Street seemed more factual. And I liked all the little, little different facts that they had on Sesame Street. So that's what I remember about Mr. Rogers. So what was your favorite show as a kid? Well, much much like you, I mean, we, we didn't have... Um there wasn't a lot of programming for, <laughs> for children when I was a, as a kid. So it was basically PBS or whenever cartoons happened to run. And so, uh, I, when I was, when I was very young, I'd watched a lot of Sesame street and Mr. Rogers and Sesame street probably was one of my favorite too. Obviously it tended to be a little bit faster pace as well. Most of the segments are just three minutes long. They based a lot of early Sesame street on commercials, uh, cause they, they thought, you know, kill, children need kind of fast paced things to, to remain engaged. That engaged me. But, uh, and then, you know, when I got older, I would just, it was all just, uh, the typical garbage that people watched in the eighties, GI Joe and Transformers and He-Man and, and cartoons, which are basically intended to sell toys. So what is something on your bucket list? Uh, well, you know, I would like to hike the Grand Canyon. Um, that's, uh, that's something that, uh, still is out there. We, we had thought about going a few summers ago and then, um, it wouldn't have been the best time to. I, I would like to I'd like to do that. I would love to get to Japan and um, and see some of the various Miyazaki related uh, things there, and take my kids over. Those are two things I still have yet to do. Well, thanks, Phil, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Well, it's always a pleasure. You've been listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest has been Dr. Philip Tallon. He has written an online exclusive film review of the new Mr. Rogers biopic, which is in theaters now, if you're listening to this, November 2019. And his review, which you can read completely free on our website, equip.org, is called The Eternal Importance of Being Awkwardly Earnest, a review of A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. We'd like to hear from you, so connect with us on social media, like the Bible Answer Man Facebook page, and follow CRI, Christian Research Journal, Hank Hanegraaff, and the Bible Answer Man on Twitter. And please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man channel on YouTube. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the Postmodern Realities Podcast on iTunes, and please rate and review our podcast. When you rate and review our podcast, it helps others see our content. And please share this episode on your social media accounts. Be sure you tune in daily to the Bible Answer Man broadcast hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff, who answers your questions live on air. To ask Hank a question, call 888-ASK-HANK, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. In addition, head to iTunes and subscribe to Hank Unplugged, Hank's audio podcast, Follow Hank off the grid where he has in-depth conversations with some of the brightest minds discussing topics you care about. So until our next Christian Research Journal author conversation, thanks for listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast.